All right, uh, another part, another edition of our um, what are we calling this? Ham, uh, how to, how to, ham how to, changing lives, changing lives. We did ham how to become an NFL scout the other day. This is ham how to become a broadcaster. You get asked a lot. How do you become a scout? I get asked a lot. I want to call games. How do I do that? And um, I'll say what we said the other day at the beginning of, of the scout conversation, which is. In my experience, when it comes to calling games, John, there are no two people with the same path. Now, a lot of people go call minor league baseball games, or a lot of people go to a college with a great broadcasting school like Syracuse or Arizona State or Missouri or Washington State, USC. But even those people don't. Even if you went to USC and found three people from SC that all went did minor league baseball, wherever they are now, they would not have the same path. Um, so I think that's the first thing. It's like you can hear everybody's story, but it doesn't necessarily apply to you. But that's it. Well, I, I think one thing needs to be clear, and again, I'm not trying to be dis- discourage anyone else, but I think this speaks to how focused you need to be in your pursuit of, of the career. How old were you when you first realized you wanted to do this for a living? Uh, I, I mean, high school. I started calling games in high school. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty big jump on a lot of people. I was probably like you, thinking about school. it in some weird way before then, but I, uh, one summer my dad was like, you got to do something. And so I went to the local Davis had a community TV station and they're like, yeah, you can call our games. Cause it was, um, Clayton Gamble's dad who was, he was a really good football player a few years older than us on the team. Right. Ran the station yeah. fullback. Yeah. And he would just film the games, and the games would go on TV with no audio, like on Wednesday night, the Davis High football game would air. Some of the biggest games the area knew with uh, yeah. Jay Middle 65 and left guard, right guard, pulling guard. Um, pulling guard. Wing yeah, T. Wing T. But so, yeah, that was it, so that was probably, I don't know, maybe our junior year of high school, I started calling games, and then we did basketball and uh, baseball too. And then, and then you went to college to become a broadcaster? Yeah. First week, I go to the student radio station. And we talked about this a lot with scouting. If, if you're past college, then we can talk about some of the other options. But if college is what you're doing now or still ahead of you, first week I went to the student radio station and took them a tape of me calling a Giants game off the TV. And, um, and, so, and they hired me to do softball games and host like some radio shows on the student radio station. So student radio station was a big deal then. But for some people, what was your, but did you have to declare a major when you applied to Fresno State or no? Uh, I don't remember. I I don't remember if I did the first semester, but I was definitely a broadcasting major. Now, a lot of be- like that helped because you had classes that were broadcasting. But experience. So did, was did you know? Thing for did me. you know they had a broadcasting major when you applied? Uh, probably. Is that part? Yeah, I don't. Is that really, part of the reason why you applied? I don't really remember why I chose to go there. Um, Pat Hill. Pat Hill. Yeah, I, I do think I see. So I went to Fresno State, so that's not a, like a broadcasting where you go and there's 30, 40 other people more. I mean, who are trying to do the same thing as you. Right. Like at some schools, you have to share broadcasting duties with a bunch of other people. I didn't. I was the only person doing all these games, which was great. Now, it doesn't mean those other there are benefits to go into Syracuse. Um, but I can only speak to the benefits I got were I got to call games from day one. I didn't have to share it with anybody. I got to do whatever I want. So I got a lot of reps early. No one else was in line to compete to like want to call the college basketball game Nobody from a student asked. standpoint. Yeah. I, so I did all the women's basketball games for several years. I did volleyball games, I did a ton of softball games, and they were good. They were going to the NCAA tournaments. Um, you know, now – I don't think I did any fo- – I did a ton of high- – I was doing high school football that whole time. And then after a couple uh, – maybe in that freshman year, I was calling a softball game, and the commercial radio station, which was the ESPN radio station, needed somebody to call something else, heard me doing a softball game and, and asked me to come do a game for them. But I got on the air at the student radio station, and that was a big deal. How did you, how'd you get better? Listening to yourself. I think this is, like, so critical. Now, and I get emails from people – who say, can you listen to my tape? And I say yes. And sometimes they have to follow up to make sure I watch it or listen to it. But I think the biggest challenge is like trying to find who you are and what you sound like. Because if you went and listened to one of my old tapes, I would not sound like I sound now. I would sound like I'm doing, I don't know, probably a John Miller or a Dave Fleming impression, right? 
Um, and so you have to just constantly listen to yourself to find yourself to be like, okay, is that me? Is that me? When you listen, like, is that me or is it not me? And then it's, to me, it's kind of like a, a, for anyone that golfs or anything, if you paint, if you draw the beauty of those of painting or drawing, probably you can just sit at home and draw for 15 hours a day. If you want, you can just constantly get better and get better and get better to call games. There's sports on all the time. They might not be airing for anybody, but you can just call games and call games and call games and call games and call games. And it just, it, I don't know if Gladwell's 10,000 hours is real, but there's something too, just over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now, part of that is you got to listen to it and then say, okay, here's one thing I don't like. Let me try and fix that one thing for the next game. The next broadcast. So you go, you go back thing. and watch every broadcast you've ever done or listen to it? No, I, I don't go back and watch every game, but I will go like now. Sometimes I do. Like I'll DVR a game, and if I've got a flight, I might download it and watch the game on the flight back. Or I'll know there were specific things I want to go check. Like, how did that come off? Did that come off well? Was that cheesy? Was that bad? Was that as bad as I thought? Was that as good as I thought? And um, and then you just get better at realizing, like, oh, that was good. Or, you know, when I watch it back, I'm going to like that. Um, and I'll tend to watch stuff back. Sometimes it's hard because you're like, God, I, I don't think that was good. But I kind of have to watch it to know, was that as bad as I thought? And usually it's not. Uh, but I think the number one thing is you got to do stuff and then you got to watch it. So like I mentioned earlier in the podcast um, that I got a DM from a 14 year old kid. It was like, I call games off the TV. And a lot of people say that I never did that as a kid. Probably should have. I did like, fa- I remember like doing taping fake radio shows. Talking to myself basically is another way. I'm telling that. you this guy, Cal Ripken, his range at shortstop. He's the all American guy. I, I don't even know. I do remember calling a radio station when I was a kid once about Patrick Ewing and Hakeem Olajuwon. I'm like, who do you guys think is better? And they really should have put me on because as we learned when you're ready, putting kids on is bad content, usually. That's off. Yeah. But nonetheless, um, I, yeah, I just think you got to rep it. You just got to rep it out, man. You just got to do it and do it and do it and do it. Um, and if you get a live game to do, great. You know, So that's where college comes into play is there's just – you are you have all these games so you're doing soccer games and volleyball games and you're doing all this stuff and the reps you do on a volleyball game translate it all translates cuz to me the number one thing i listen for when i listen for some when i listen to somebody's tape is timing like do they have a sense of timing or not and i think you can get when better you say at timing it. you mean like when a shot's hit just or like, when something yeah, happens just like a pa- like a pacing like do they is there a rhythm or is there not a rhythm? Do they have rhythm or not? Um, and, you know, I don't know. I, it's, it's, I, it's almost, I've done so many, I've repped so many times, it's hard to remember. I feel like I always had, when I listened, pretty good rhythm, like early on. But I'm sure it's something you can learn as long as you know that you're listening for it. Um, but that's always the first thing I listen for is, does somebody have a rhythm? Like, do they have a feel? It's just, it's hard to describe, but it's just like a feel. And I think the only way you get a feel is with practice, with understanding. Like, okay, I need to say the pitch is on the way before it get like, as it's being released. Otherwise, you're going to hear the crack of the bat, and you're going to go, here's the pitch, crack. Or you're going to go, crack, here's the pitch. It's amazing how many times it happens. I listen back to, my, to myself, and sometimes it happens, where you're like, here's the pitch. And you're actually behind, even though you think you're on time. So getting ahead of stuff like that. And it gets to the point where I try so hard now to be ahead that there are, I've had a few moments where you go, whoa. Like, I had one last year, Air Force, Colorado. Touchdown! He's down at the seven. Overtime. <laughs> uh, Caden Remsburg is the name of the Air Force guy. It's their first possession of OT. They get him, like, on an end around. So it's like a 25-yard run. I'm go- You know, at, he's, like, at the three, and I say touchdown as he's diving. Well, it works out perfect because the timing is perfect as long as he actually crosses the goal line. I caught that one a little tight. I remember I was like, oh, I better go back and watch that because that felt a little tight. Now, if you watch right, it, it he was feels kind of early. Shoved out. Yeah, it's just he better make it or else it's going to sound, if he's in, then the timing is perfect. But he's got to be in. So, But I, that's something I worked on a lot is be ahead or be on time. And to be on time for a long time, you got to feel like you're almost ahead of a play to get on time. So. It really is like when people shit on Joe Buck. The amount of time he had to just sit there with his dad over the years and listen to it. Like there is just something like with Kyle Shanahan, the advantage he has of the way he's probably listening to things and talking like it just 
it's not even replicable for someone like you who's just like most of our parents do other things. Yeah. You're not even talking about it in that verbiage that he's probably was just so well prepared before he even really started. I think the other thing that he really I, I'm a Joe Buck. I have been for a long time a fan. of. I think he does a great job. I think one thing that is so hard to get is like this comfort that you belong when you're young, like to sound like you're comfortable and you belong and you're just yourself. And I would imagine if we asked Joe, like, if you listen back or watch something from when you were 23, is there anything you'd change? I'm sure he would. But he was good then. And part of it is just, to your point, like, Kyle Shanahan just has a comfort around a locker room. Joe just had a comfort because it was a comfortable environment for him young. And that's that comfort, you cannot fake that experience. You cannot fake that that comfort. So, Do you, do you think, like, when you were in college to where you're at now, you're like what you desire to do and what you desire to call has changed. Not what I desire to call. I mean, I think, um, the, cause you've done what NBA games, you've done base MLB games. Yeah. If I would have told you in college, you would get to do an NBA champions games. Who's in the middle of a dynasty and call major league baseball games. Yeah. That would have been a pretty big deal. Right. By the time you're in your yeah. early thirties, you'll be doing this. Right. Yeah. It would have been. A, yeah. Yes. Now, I don't know that I would have been like, no, way. like, I, I think I probably thought that's what was going to happen. I felt confident that, that was going to happen. Um, you know, or college, fo- like, t- like games on TV, like people actually see, like that would have been a really big deal to me too. Um, it is a big deal to me. Um, so I, you know, I, I always kind of felt like that was going to happen. That like, like, yeah, of course. Like, I think I'm, you know, I probably thought I was better than I was for a long time. And I was lucky by the time I got to do the Warriors, do the A's, um, or that, you know, like the first FS1 game I did, I was like, I, God, I, I thought I was good at parts, but I can be a lot better. And so I was lucky that I got another chance. And so now I feel like I got these opportunities to do things and the tape reflects, like, I think it takes a while, or at least it did for me, where the tape sounds as good as you feel like you are. Like I probably thought I was better than my tape sounded like I was for a long time where I'd give it to somebody like, check it out and be like, yeah, you sound like every other guy. The tape never lies guy. The tape never lies. Congrats on sounding like every other guy that does triple a baseball. You know, the eye in the sky never lies or the record button. Well, but I felt like it sometimes be like, God, why is it so hard for me to find like great tape? Like it's out there. And that is one challenge It's like, if you're not doing big games, it might be hard for you to have a tape where it's like, I need five minutes on TV that the crowd is great and the game is close and there's like these big moments and it's it's hard to get that. So I think while you're doing all the stuff that isn't as good, you have to just understand that all of this stuff is going to help you. That moment when it comes, you might only get a few shots at them. So you, all this is going to get you ready for that moment and kind of that moment will, you might feel like you're ready for that moment before it comes, but good. You should be ready for that moment before it comes. Like you should hope that that moment is late because if the moment's early, you're not ready for it. You, you, you're you going to kick yourself over it. You don't know if you're going to get another shot. So when all you, those when you say that are a, so valuable. Did a lot of people like in any job, you know, scouting's the same way. Like you, you get the internship. You think you could be the GM. You, you're doing a high school softball game. You think, fuck, I should be doing the Yankees. Right. Like you need to take advantage of like you just said those reps and as well as you can be present where you're at yeah. and put all the chips in the middle of the table and don't yep. treat it like it sucks. Even though you'll look back, you actually appreciate it more the farther you are away. Right. Who was I <laughs> Even though it does, it's not something you'd want to do. You know who it was? You and I were talking about this when we played golf a few weeks ago that we had both listened to Kevin Hart on the Joe Rogan podcast. And one thing Kevin was talking about was it really resonated with me, and I'm it, I know it does it did with you too. He's like he was I think he was talking about his kids and you know how t- you know how his kids obviously have a different advantage he didn't have when he was growing up because he was really poor and his p- kids have opportunities now right because Kevin's made a lot of money and it's connected and all that. But he said if you don't ever struggle, he's like I always wonder this if you don't struggle if you just everything just is handed to you what do you talk about with other people, right? Like, I love running into somebody that's called minor league baseball. You just have this instant, like, oh, man. Or I, I did Arena 2 football. There used to be this minor league arena team. It was 200 bucks a week. I got to miss class to do it. We would travel. I only did road games. The travel was a bitch. I mean, there was not 
the team would be split up on multiple flights. We wouldn't even have a bus usually. It'd be like multiple vans that, you know, you had the the like this the GM of the team. And when I say GM, I don't mean like in a football sense. I just mean like the guy who handled the marketing. The head of marketing was my color analyst. The head coach was Fred Bolitnikoff Jr., who I know is he's out in the Bay Area. Awesome dude. I text him every once in a while. He would like drive one of the vans. The the marketing guy who uh, was also my radio analyst who drank on the air drove one of the vans like one of the two trainers drove vans like there was always like some outbreak you know like every season drank like, drank drank like a beer or uh, like yeah cocktails. like you'd get a beer from the from the stands i remember the best player on the team was a high school teacher Wes borba taught at chowchilla high school i think he was always didn't matt Bar- wasn't matt barnes brother on the team J- jason barnes was on the team one year yeah he he a boise state guy no, I think he was Sacramento State. Sacramento State, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the guys, like one of the stars of the team one year was this guy. He went on to be the backup quarterback for the uh, San Jose team, but he set like a record with like 103 touchdown passes. Scott Rizlov, he was a San Jose State guy. But those, that grind, like you right now if you said, hey guy, you can go do this, it'll be 200 bucks a week. You got to travel to Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, and uh, no one will be listening. And uh, you are going to stay in like Motel 6 and you're going to eat. You're going to have a roommate and you're going to eat at Cracker Barrel. I'd be like, no chance in hell am I doing that, right? But then it was an incredible experience. It was such a great – and part of the experience was just learning to be around players, learning how to talk to players, learning how to talk to coaches. One one of my favorite stories I called a game where the broadcast booth was a tough shed turned sideways – with a hole sawed out in the side of it, and they put two chairs in it. That was the broadcast booth, right? It was awesome. So you got, like, and I think you said this when it came to scouting, the same thing applies to broadcasting. Say yes. Can you do this? Yeah. Do you know anything about soccer? Have you ever called a soccer game before? Yeah. Sure. I called well, t- I, I call well, a soccer game from the roof of an RV. We just They just drove an RV to midfield. They put us on the roof, John. That was the broadcast booth. So, so, yes. To me, this is for this is for anyone in college or just trying to write out in that 22, 23, 24-year-old sweet spot. When you get, I would say, 30, but definitely once you get to your mid-30s, like where we're – I can't, like you said, the things that I did in my early 20s, if you offered me that, I'd laugh in your face. I laugh in the face of some offers that I shouldn't be laughing in the face <laughs> just because I know it's the right thing to do to get myself a little more. Right. You will never – ever be more naive in a good way to just try different things and where they lead you is uh, unknown and what whatever it's like it, to me i am a big believer in being passionate about something and if you are it makes work so much better and if you're good at it you're gonna make the money not every job pays like wall street or facebook right out of college but there are a lot of people at those companies that fucking hate life hate work yeah i don't view mondays as shitty I don't view we record podcasts on Sundays. When you when you did what, what scouts or broadcasting, your your days are like you called a game a couple of years ago on Thanksgiving. Like that's just part of it. You don't even think about it like that though. And I, I think it helps your life, just your your sanity a little bit when you are passionate about whatever you do. And if you're passionate about something, that means you'll put a lot of effort in. And it's usually hard to fail. Obviously, we're talking about broadcasting or football or talking sports or whatever. I do think that speaks for a lot of, you know, people that feel like, God, I wish I would have done what I wanted to do. It gets you get to a certain point where it probably does get too late or at least you'd be unwilling to make a change because of the step back, which I understand. But we got a lot of people listening in their 20s like now's the time. Well, but, and I think part of that hang up, right, is like what will other people think if, if you're listening, and you're not in college and you're 36 and you want to call games. What will what will my friends think if I'm instead of hanging out with them on a Friday night? Uh, or what will my, you know, will my, is it cool? Will my wife be cool if I decide I'm going to go call some high school football games this week? Um, you know, so that's probably, I think a roadblock for some people is like, well, other people think it's weird when I walk in there and it's like, whatever you people want to do this. And there's, I'm, I'm not trying to, to break up a happy home. Not trying to yeah. break up a happy home, but she's not supportive guy to your passions. Might have the wrong girl. Good point. <laughs> Very good point. Um, you yeah. know, should be a supportive partnership. That's right. That's right. All that stuff is val- All that stuff is really now. Her valuable. answer might be like, "Well, how are we going to feed our children?" Yeah, they're getting. Well, you got to be doing that too. You got to, you know, <laughs> you're going to be, you're going to be putting in some hours. But, you know, I think, like I told, I mentioned something earlier about how I got to 
and we're talking specifically about play by play, but on the podcast, I mentioned that I was just, the way I got to the Bay area was I was just doing a radio show and I got an email and said, Hey, would you come up here and audition? Um, and part of that was I had done, I had called minor league baseball for three years for the Fresno Grizzlies. And so part of that job with the A's was doing the pre and post game. So I think that's part of why I got offered that job too. And the, like, that was an incredible, valuable experience doing minor league baseball. And in those days I would do a radio show from three to six, get off the air and then do the, do three innings. Doug Greenwald did was the main guy. I was the number two guy. Um, so you think if you were pigeonholed as like a hockey or basketball guy, you probably wouldn't have got the. Well, maybe they would ask me to do yeah some shark stuff. I don't know. But um, uh, you know, I I think that there are things now that I wouldn't that I wouldn't do right now. But in retrospect, I was at a place where. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So, like, most things I've gotten have not been, hey, we heard you. We want to give you a job, right? That's happened to me a few times. Hey, I heard you doing this. We want you to do this. Cool. But most thing is banging down doors and banging down doors. So don't be fooled by, hey, somebody called me because they heard me, and that's how I got a job. Like, those are breaks, but they're not the main way that I got opportunities. Yeah. Most of them was bang and no and no. No, we don't want – I remember one time I took my tape to the Fresno Heat Wave. It was like an – I don't even know what level of basketball it was. And they were like, no, we're good. Like I've had way more of those experiences where you look back, oh, how could you guys say no to me? Then I have like someone reaches out and just wants you because they heard you. That's mine. That <laughs> Somebody else might have a different experience. But what I was going to say is, so if you're past college or even if you're in co- whatever age you are, yeah, there's a certain level where now all the jobs are by and large people banging on doors going, there's 80 people trying to get one job. But you could probably – walk over to the high school in your area and go, hey, are you guys streaming the games on the internet? I'm a, I'm available, right? Like you could go, like those opportunities are out there right now for you to find if you want to go find them. No matter, you might be 14, you might be 44. Like that you can do. There are not a lot of people, there are some people doing it, but not a lot of them, right? So that one, if you want a place to start and you're willing to do that, you can go do that right now. I, I would be surprised if you couldn't. I think it's pretty smart. Or just call your, your or call your NBA 2K games on Twitch. I mean, I don't know. Like, well, you're you're right though. There are, there has never been. I say this all the time. More opportunities to separate yourself because of the internet. And I don't think of them necessarily in broadcast terms, but it's so. Guy, put your put tapes on Instagram. Your Instagram page. Just have an Instagram page of just your calls of calling games that are getting replayed on television. Right. 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 Just you. You can do anything personalize it and distribute it through LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You you just, you got to just start and then you'll realize what works, what doesn't work. And like you said, I think a lot of people get consumed. What, what is my uh, brother going to think about me on Instagram, you know, or my mom, my mom's friend's going to make fun of me. And you just, if you think like that, then you just, you'll never do anything for yourself. you 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 said something earlier that I think is really true about just being passionate. And you were talking about, we had a question from somebody earlier. Well, you about. know why, guy? Because I, I despise, and let me repeat, despise doing things I don't like to do. Despise it. Now, as Absolutely. you get older, you realize, and you know this, once you get married, you have, there are things that you have to do that you don't like as much. And I'd put that into a little different category. I'm talking more professionally, even though you still, you just sucks, but it's part of the deal. I- I Professionally, just, I can't imagine having to do consistently. Now, no matter what you do, you could we could own a company in ten years, Haber Middlecoff, making twenty million each for us. There are going to be parts of that that we're not going to like doing. Yeah. It's not it's not like there's some utopia. But the more things you can feel like being in your office, working on a podcast fucking topic, or looking and reading stuff that's gonna you're going to talk about at eight o'clock at night on a Tuesday, is work. You know, it technically is. And I don't even it doesn't even cross my mind, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, were you get ready there for might a be game somebody out there who, who wants to do a podcast? For them, making money on the podcast is not their objective, right? So for them, they don't need. They just hey, I just want to do it and see what happens. Like you should totally do that. Um, but I also think a lot of people are conditioned to be like, oh, what is that person doing? Out of like an insecurity. If you do it with passion, if you're just all in on it, I think people will view it differently. They go, oh, this person, wow, they they don't care what I think. They're just all in on whatever they do, and that is. 
it's not about attraction, but that is a good quality to have. And I think people are attracted to that. Like, oh, that's a weird thing. They don't look and go, oh, that's weird. They go, man, this person's all in on this and they're pretty good at it or they're they're giving it a shot. So, yeah, it's weird to go sit up in the last section of a stadium and just call a game into a phone. But if you want to do it, do it. And it will benefit you. It will not hurt you at all. Um, I think one of the great hacks that I had in doing radio when I started in college doing working at the commercial radio station and I was just producing and that's the other thing is there's a whole other side of this which is not play by play which is just doing shows and I think I got 10,000 hours of just thinking about topics really quickly but one of the great hacks and anybody can do this is you Judd Apatow has told the story about how when he was in high school he started like a radio show and he would just interview people and that's how he got connected with a lot of people like Larry that's how he got connected with Larry Sanders who became his mentor for life right or not Larry Sanders uh Larry Sanders was the fake character. What's his real name? Bill Maher. Gary Shandling. Hey, Gary Shandling. Gary, but R. Judd R. Apatow just had a com- just did interviews because nobody, no high school kid was calling Gary Shandling or any other Hollywood people at the time. So I did a radio show. Well, the hack you can't call up somebody you admire and be like, "Hey, man, would love to just talk to you for twenty minutes. Take your time for twenty minutes." But I was able to talk to a lot of people just because that's a way to talk to people. Like, hey, I got a radio show. Would you come on? And like you said, you ask enough, people will come on. Anybody will come yeah. on eventually, as long as you can get a hold of them. And so I had some really kind of uh, rewarding experiences, things that really gave me encouragement um, early on. Like I remember one time doing the radio show, and I was young, but I had Rusillo on, and he came on for 20 minutes. And afterwards he was like, you know, man, that was really good. And I was like, that that made a huge difference for me. Just that somebody that gave you a little bit of confidence. And it's how you it's how you make connections. If you go to college, I do think that I'll say this. You don't have to go to Syracuse, but if you do, great. I do think there is a value going to a school that has sports. And if you have football, it, particularly if it's Division One football, you will have TV crews coming to your school. And if there are TV crews, there are people to meet and there are jobs to volunteer for. Right. So th- that's a big deal. If you've got men's and women's basketball and you got softball and you got baseball, that's a lot of games. So I, I do think if you're looking for a college, it doesn't have to be the number one broadcasting school, but it should be a place that there will be opportunities. There will be opportunities for you to broadcast. Yeah, that's if, if you I don't get say. into SC, it's not the big end of the deal. If you yeah. get to San Diego State, you could argue you might be able to separate yourself faster at San Diego State than you could at USC, right? Yeah, you might get more reps, that's and, for sure. I also think every time that you feel that you're in a, a non-advantageous situation, you do have to think outside the box, like you said. Like, well, I, I'm not in school anymore. Well, if you got if you got a big high school football program in your backyard, you got to think like guy. Or you have like some big AAU tournament, or just think about something, some way possible that you gotta that you gotta try to get a strikeout, right? <laughs> you know, you might not be able to throw a fastball, but you gotta get the out. You know, and I, I think sometimes people get very, very frustrated. And, and the older you get, I become this way. When you're young, you don't even think about it because you don't even know. You're like, well, I got to do this, this, and this. You're just like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to show up at this guy's house, knock on his door, see what he says. But the older you get, you're like, I don't know if I'd do that, right? Yeah. When you're young, you just try everything. You just try every pitch. <laughs> and then some work, some don't. And then when you're like 40 years old, drinking beers with your buddies, you're like, I remember when I used to do that. And sometimes that just being relentless you know, it's just usually how you get in with just crazy, weird ideas. So if you want something bad enough, I always feel like people attain it. And that's what's cool about success stories is most of them don't look like some direct path to wherever they got. Yeah. yeah right. Right. No. But so you but, just but got to you, me. You have to have patience. There are things with broadcasting. There's the baseline of stuff you, you have gotta to be, be able yeah, to do. You got to be good enough. I would say this, like looking back, you have to have and I'm kind of in the right we're in the middle of the whole story so i'm not really this isn't a retrospective but you have to have patience even though i can tell you this at no point along the way have i been patient right but you don't have a choice i think that like i'm an in yeah. i am impatient i am not patient at all but i i, I think there's a good example of I, i've heard like gary v and tony robbins and people talk about like sometimes a mistake is being patient like think you have to wait 20 years to obtain something mm-hmm but I think you have to be very impatient with your aggressiveness, but understand like it took Joe Lake up a long time to get something built. Yeah. And you'd say he's really impatient. Well, like you have to be realistic with your expectations of like, you're not going to be Colin 
fucking Yankee games tomorrow if you're 23. You're not going to be the GM for, you know, the, the 49ers next week. Like, there are just – there are things, but you can make big-time hay, hay, you know, headway by just being really aggressive and relentless in your pursuit of what you want that you're impatient. But there's also, to me, a balance of – and I battled this when I was young, you were probably better at this than me, of just being patient when you're, once you get the opportunity to be around certain people, sometimes you got to listen more than you talk. Mm. And I think sometimes that you can, in any professional situation or just introduction situation, when you kind of act like a know-it-all, and listen, we all at 25 or 28 or 20 think we know way more than we do, and that is never going to change. That's a good thing. To me, that's a healthy thing. You should think that. Now, you learn to harness that, but you got to be careful what you say. And, and you don't want to be the loudmouth, annoying, know it all, because you will get shunned. Uh, you know, you, you will just be kind of a clown. And I, I, I battled that sometimes, I think, when I was really young at Fresno State. And then you just you get humbled fast. But the thing is, with football, maybe unlike broadcasting, they will just tell you to shut the fuck up. You know, it's a very more there's elements in other professions where they might not tell you that, but they ain't going to recommend you or talk about you for anything. And I'd say the media is probably more like that than football, which I was lucky. You just get you just get screamed at like you would in your house. Uh, It's 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 a great point. There are a handful of people who I say, hey, I'd love some feedback. And let me be really clear about this when I because everyone says like, hey, feel free to be critical. Well, first of all, not everyone's going to watch like an hour of your tape and write you a bunch of notes like that's asking a lot but i think what's helpful when you ask somebody for feedback is ask a specific question what do you think about what i did here because otherwise it's people are really hesitant to be super critical of you when they watch your tape um so you have to be the most critical person it doesn't mean like i simultaneously can think i suck but also be really confident right it's like i no, I can be better than this. This is below my standard, if that makes sense. Even those two things don't feel like they go together. Um, it's a weird combination of like, God, I my standard's so much higher, right? I, right. It's So you got to have a few people who you can, like, look, I mean it when I say, please be critical of this. Or you're lucky. Maybe just have a, a you're around somebody who is willing, who trusts that you can handle criticism. I always say this when I, like, do hosting stuff. I would talk to producers, and my I always say it is, the former players who are analysts can take coaching a lot better than the hosts can. Like the the broadcasters, they act like they can take criticism, but they're mostly a God, soft I, I would say I would say the majority of people in the media are horrendous at taking criticism, even though they give condition, out the majority of it. Right? I always like condition. All of a sudden, someone writes a review of them. It's like, oh, how dare this is art. It's like whatever. You can't. This is what we do, so they can do it. Players have thick skin. They get yelled at and coached all the time. So have, you know, be hard on yourself. Be hard on you. You have to be. You have to be really. You have to be hard on yourself, and um, that's the only way you get better. So anyway, I think back to your point about patience. Yes, it's not about just sitting back and waiting for to come to you, waiting for it to come to you. The whole time I was in retrospect being patient, I was constantly sending out tapes and emails and calling like, please, for the love of God. And it was no and no and no and no. There's a million no's. Um, But I think the same thing we talked about with scouting. All you need is one person to be like, okay. Of the 32 teams, I'll give you a job. So that's one of the things with play-by-play is there are – minor league baseball is huge for it because there's just so many jobs, and you don't have to have a ton of experience to get one of those jobs. Now, they're competitive, but, you know, if we roll back next year and there's half of minor league baseball is gone, that's a lot of opportunities because those jobs turn over a lot, and they, it's just – so you got to find other other paths. But that's where, you know, calling video games off Twitch, I, I mean it. Like that's – I probably would have done that. Right. If I was 15 yeah. right now, I probably would have done that. Like I, I would maybe I'll do it out. again. Who knows? <laughs> Let me know yeah. if there's a football season. You might see. Not me a bad Twitch. idea. Reach out to Big Cat. See if uh, you know if you're an aspiring guy. See if you can call yeah. one of his games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? But anyway, so I'm sure there's you know that's like we did with scouting. That's the short version. But DMs are open. If you ever need any advice, yeah, DM Haberman. <laughs> 